Okay, we'll see how it goes. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. Happy Monday. Um, very good to see you. Uh, this week is your first real practical in which you will meet your, your two graduate TAs. I think it's, um, it's a little unfair to have one teacher for a thousand students. It's totally ridiculous. And if you've tried to email me, you'll probably notice that it does take me a while to respond to emails because I get uh, between 70 and 100 emails I have to respond to every day, and it's kind of hard for me to, to keep up. So you will have two graduate TAs that I have, uh, uh, teaching assistants that I have trained up over the past, past few weeks and, and months. And um, these people are working on a master's or a PhD in physics, really uh, good, good people that, um, like I say, know what's going on in the course, know what's going on with uh, your problem sets, and should hopefully be able to, to help you out. And so there's only 36 of you in the room for the two uh, TAs, so sort of like a, you know, 18 to 1 student to teacher ratio, a little more humane. They hopefully will get to know you a little better than I will. Um, you're gonna be working in small groups, so these are tables uh, where there's four chairs, sort of rolling chairs, and um, so you've seen them, I guess, when you did this pre-course test, but now you'll have assigned seating this, this week. Um, and uh, if you're the archivist, you write down your methods, sort of journal format, and that gets marked. And the way it works is that you just have one booklet per pod and your, your team shares the mark. So and in order to, to try to help things along, we're sort of assigning these roles. Um, the roles should sort of rotate each practical so that you take on each role at least once or twice during the, the semester. You're gonna meet like nine times for the practicals, right? So these are the roles we sort of came up with, me and the TAs. We thought manager, um, archivist, whoop, sort of weird order there, um, lead theorist and lead experimentalist. So you can kind of imagine what those, those are meant to kind of do. Um, okay, and then it gets a little confusing because I've placed you in randomly into one of these seasons. You sometimes you might see this on one of your groups or something like that, um, fall, uh, winter, spring, or summer. And the idea being that, I'll try to send you some little hints, but um, you'll keep the same season all, whatever, all of this semester, but every week, each season will have the different role at your pod. So at each pod, hopefully there's four people with four different seasons, and that they're gonna assign your seating that way. So this week, if you're fall, you're the manager, and if you're winter, you're the archivist. If you're um, spring, you're the lead theorist, and the summers are the lead experimentalist. And you may have even received a little email or a, a message from me on Quirkus, kind of giving you a heads up, some background, like a background video for the theorist or the experimentalist. And then next week, you switch roles and keep the same season. So next week, the falls are the lead experimentalists, et cetera, and we're gonna switch it every week. Um, and then there's also a problem set, which is due on Sunday. Um, somebody was actually asking, can you clarify how the problem sets work? I'm getting confused when it refers to Etkina um, 2, problem 20, skip the margins question. So uh, that, that question has a, la a last sentence asking you about margins of uncertainty. But if you actually go to submit the problem set, you will see that it's a, it's a multiple choice quiz marked automatically by Quirkus. So it kind of looks like this. Um, you click on, take the quiz, and then you see every question come up as multiple choice, all 20 of them, actually. So question nine that the student was asking about, you know, there's only four choices there, <laughs> and it's nothing about the margins. So it'll be a little more clear when you're actually submitting what I mean by that, hopefully. Even the questions towards the end that are not from Akina are actually gonna end up as multiple choice questions, like I, I've converted them to multiple choice for the, for the purpose of marking. So I, so I certainly recommend you, you write these out and try them, um, uh, but uh, that's the way that goes, yes? Pardon? Problem set didn't get marked? Mm, okay. 
So you already did the problem set? All right, so somebody's saying you're not displaying the mark or something. So again, sometimes in order to display a mark on Quarkus, I have to press a button or something. So, so uh, I'll do that at some point. Okay. Um, somebody asked if it was really if I really meant it when I said um, question eight. So I think question eight really is question, question eight. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't do the problem set before practicals. In fact, you're gonna be going over trying to work on the problem set during practicals. So it's good to get started. I'm amazed you guys finished it already. It's really amazing. But it's not due till Sunday, so I thought you'd work on it. Somebody asked, uh, do we uh, get assigned? So yeah, it's assigned seating in the practicals. But you should hopefully come to practicals already knowing which of the four seasons you are. You won't know what table to sit at, your TA will tell you, like what numbered table somehow, but um, hopefully you already know your role, your season somehow. Uh, no, but we have a role of archivist. Uh, where do we get the term booklet? So your TA is just gonna give you one. We have a bunch of blank ones. So you don't have to bring anything really, just something to write with for sure. So there uh, is something called Vic Peer Tutors. There's an announcement on the Quarkus page about this, uh, but they are starting actually tomorrow morning in room 125B. It's some, uh, actually they're, they're good students who took this course last year, the undergraduates um, who applied. And it's not, I think it's paid for by Victoria College, but anybody can access it and even apply for it. Um, so these students got really high mark in Physics 131 last, <laughs> last year, and they're gonna be there for you to try to help you to, with, with things uh, at these times. Okay, drop-in style, so the tutor sort of works with students individually, same sort of like an office hour, you can just come in with your problems and they can come around and try to give you, give you some guidance there. Do you wanna take a look a little bit? So this soccer practice, so the idea here is that it's important to know that the average speed is uh, not the same, is, is not the magnitude of the average velocity. Um, I guess in the instantaneous, if you look at instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous speed is the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity, but it, it doesn't work with a, that way for the averages. Um, is not the so what it is, is average speed is just the path length divided by the time. Over time. So I could call it maybe L divided by T. So L is going to be, they start at the goal, they run 10 meters, and back to the goal, so it's 20. And then they run 20 meters, and then back to the goal, so there's a 40. Finally, they ran 30 meters, turn around, and run back to the goal again, and so that's another 60. So I think that's something like 120. Uh, and then there's all these times. And so the time, I haven't really worked this through yet, uh, so that's 2.5 plus 2.8 plus 5.7 plus 6.7 plus 12 plus 15. Just add up all the times, add up all the, the distances, and divide. So just plug these into here. I think you get 2.7. And then this one is the average velocity um, is just equal to the displacement um, divided by the time. And the displacement is zero <laughs> because they didn't go anywhere. Make sense? If you get back to the same place, then your average velocity is always zero because your displacement's zero. You guys okay with that? Yep. I can't hear you. Maybe we could try this though. You ready for 
the microphone. <laughs> I'm going to chuck it to you. Watch out. Good catch. Thank you. Question? <laughs> Sorry, but it says, it says the magnitude of velocity, and the magnitude isn't, does not equal zero, right? Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, that's, so that's a good point. I didn't ask for the, the direction. Thanks. Um, the average velocity is zero. The magnitude is zero, zero. I mean, it wasn't asking for direction in the, in the different, the distractors, I guess. And so that's why I put that there. Okay, so, so it is important. I don't want to get feedback on this thing. Um, the main thing here is that the magnitude of the average velocity is not the same as the average speed. Average speed is just like how far you went divided by how, how much time it took. It's really like the average that it's saying in your speedometer or something. It's sort of more um, sort of interesting. Like if you drive in a big circular path and it's 100 kilometers, it takes about an hour, then your average speed was 100 kilometers per hour. Your average velocity is, I guess, zero because you came back to your starting point, and then the magnitude is zero, zero. <laughs> yeah, see what you mean. That magnitude might have thrown you off there. And then this, you toss the ball straight up, giving an initial um, upward velocity of 18 meters per second. What's the, the velocity of the ball? Um, 0.5 seconds after you release it. So I would say that the initial y is 18. So I would define um, up to be plus y meters per second. And then you're asked, I think vy is just going to be equal to v initial y plus a sub y times t. So a sub y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's a free fall question. So I just got 18 minus 9.8 times 0 0.5. So multiply those out. 18 minus, 18 minus uh, I guess, 4.9 is going to be um, about plus 13 meters per second. So it's in the plus y direction. That's it. Okay. So we got, and then somebody asked me about how the wedding went. Went very well. I had that picture actually of us doing that dance. It's a clip from a video there. But uh, she's right now in uh, Negril, settling into a resort for her honeymoon. Um, and actually, the interesting thing that happened is right while they were saying their vows, it was sort of an outdoor wedding in front of a church. This cat came up and it was like sort of rubbing everybody's legs on the, the, the wedding party that were standing there. It was kind of hilarious. And then just as they were talking to each other in the vows about their cat, that's when the cat was right there. And it was a black and white cat anyway. Everyone was laughing. Claudia, happy birthday. I think that's somebody said there on the pre-class quiz. Okay. So here's a question. Um, and it's a bit similar to something that's going on in problem sets and kind of thing that you might get on this mini test or whatever. Uh, so let's go through it. It's a little, uh, some, sometimes this stuff is a bit hard. It's about all this average speed thing. You hike two-thirds of the way to the top of the hill at a speed of V1, and then the final third at the speed of V2, what's your average speed? So, um, so I, I'm going to kind of draw this. If you're going up, there's a person going up the hill with V1. So what, is the, what does it mean two-thirds of the way. I think what this means, two-thirds of the way, I think that means two-thirds of the distance. It doesn't really say it so explicitly, but I'm going to assume this implies um, distance, not time. So anyway, I'm going to assume that what, it, what they mean there is that um, if the whole way is D or something, then D1 is two-thirds of D, and D2 is like one-third of D. And so they're going V2 for this portion of the trip and V1 for this portion of the trip. And then D1 plus D2 is equal to the total distance. So that's sort of how I'm translating it and sketching it out. 
And then the idea here is that um, I think to get it, I'm going to say that by definition, I'm going to skip to the represent mathematically because I kind of need this equation. V average is equal to um, uh, the distance, that's the path length, divided by the time. So, uh, so I'm going to use that equation. So what I need is I need, I know I've got D, I need the total time. backwards a little bit. So T1, I'm going to say, is the time for uh, the first, um, like 2D over 3. And T2 is equal to the time for the last, like D over 3. And we can find those, I think, right? And then the time here is going to be T1 plus T2. So, so I can do, what I can do is I can use this idea that um, V1 is the 2D over 3 divided by T1. And so I can solve out for T1 there. It's equal to 2 times D divided by 3 times V1. And then similarly, V2 is equal to the D over 3 divided by the T2. And solve that for T2, and you get D over 3v2. So if I want to find the v average, I can, it's the total distance divided by the total time. t1 plus t2. So um, that's d divided by uh, 2d over, it's getting a little messy looking here, plus d over 3v2. So now you have to try to solve that out. Um, I think what I might do is I f if I multiply the top and the bottom times 3 divided by D, you know how you're allowed to multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing? Um, then you get, just to try to simplify things, I get the V average is equal to 3 divided by to the d's go away then, which is good, because I didn't really know d, plus 1 over v2. And now the trick, I don't like having fractions on my denominator, so I'm going to times the top and bottom by um, uh, v1 times v2. If that's, sorry, it's a bit messy. That's supposed to be a v. So now this equals uh, equals three v one v two divided by so the two over v one times v one v two is just two v two plus and the one over v two times v one v two is just um, v one. So I guess that's the answer. Okay. Next, I want to do a top hat question. More conceptual. This is like a real work through kind of question. But uh, let's do a conceptual question. I guess you seem to be copying it down. So. It's always good to take notes, I think. I remember things better if I actually write it down. Okay, ready? I want to do this top hat question. Here's a motion diagram of a car moving along a straight road. And you can see right there that I've defined positive to be towards the right because I've got the origin marked as zero and I've kind of labeled the x-axis. So this is chapter two, one-dimensional motion, positive towards the right. And there's the motion diagram and there's little arrows drawn between the dots. So there's no tricks here. We know that the uh, object is moving from right to left. Like, if you number them, the first one is the one on the right, and then it goes all the way until it ends up at the, at the origin. So pick a... Here, I'm, I can even do the actual laptop here. Just 
See it? Oh. It doesn't really show it. There we go. A, B, C, D, or E. Okay. I'll do a timer. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't know if there's a timer on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know that if you text your answer, it associates the answer with, uh, with your phone number, and that gets stored. And then at some point this semester, if you go on to Top Hat in your account and put your phone number in there, it'll, it'll give those points. So, um, so you could try that if your internet is a little slow. Let's see what people are saying here. There we go. A lot of people are saying they like D, um, and I liked D as well. So, what was I thinking there? So, first of all, uh, I think that um, since it's moving from right to left, the velocity is always negative. And so, what I think is that this is like this is like t equals zero down here, and then time increases as it's going from right to left. So what I think is happening is that um, here, Vx is negative, but then it speeds up. So I think over here, for the next little bit of time, Vx is more negative. <laughs> okay, more negative, I guess, than the faster you're going towards the negative infinity. Make sense? Okay. I think we should launch these things. So let's, let's show you some uh, projectile motion in 2D that Jonathan has set up. This is to get you ready for projectile motion stuff that's going on mostly in chapter three, which we're starting on Wednesday. So because we've already done just dropping the basketball on the, and the tennis ball, which was that what we showed you last time is that if you neglect air resistance, they just fall with the same 9.8. So that's the vertical acceleration. So the question is what happens if we launch something with some horizontal motion as well? So how the heck does this work? You need a little pump. We'll pump the air from here, go through the tube, so it connects into here. Or hopefully it collects into there. We have all these launchers. I actually have a tennis ball launcher as well we should bring in at some point, so. But this is the, okay, you guys ready? <laughs> uh oh, you've lost your, your pressure. Is the pressure stored up there then? Or? It should still be up there, I think okay. it is. It's more, there's more resistance, so let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, we definitely lost pressure. 
It must be in the, uh, in the pipe somewhere. I think so. <laughs> There's the old adage, it's, um, so, so biology demonstrations always smell bad, chemistry demonstrations always explode, and physics demonstrations never work. I'll <laughs> <laughs> oh, go one more time. Maybe some is getting through. What we can do is fix it for next time as well when we're doing chapter three. That's okay. <laughs> I saw you. All right. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So, um, so back to this basketball. Last time I was told you uh, that the force of gravity is 10 times greater on the basketball than on the tennis ball. And yet the free fall accelerations are the same. So how the heck can that be true? Well, how do you find acceleration? As it turns out, um, since so we're talking about chapter three, uh, this is a chapter three idea. So chapter three will start talking about two dimensions, but also it'll start talking about dynamics and forces. It's uh, Newton's second law, which is an equation. Um, it is A is equal to F over M. So, um, and actually this is, uh, well, it's the sum, I guess, of all the forces. So uh, A is acceleration. That's what we're trying to find. Um, and uh, this symbol, the sigma F, is the sum, I guess it's the vector sum of all the forces. Sometimes people call it of all forces. Sometimes people call it the net force on the object. And then uh, M is the mass of the object, in the, the ball in this case. And so the way you do it is that in free fall, the only force on the object is gravity. The force of gravity. And so um, this sum of forces just equals F gravity or something, you can call it that. And there's an equation for that, which is M times G, where G is defined as 9.8 Newtons per kilogram. So you take your uh, constant 9.8 in Newtons, multiply it by your mass in kilograms, and you get the force of gravity in Newtons. So N is what's called Newtons. It's a unit of force we'll talk about more in chapter three. So then the acceleration is equal to um, F gravity divided by the mass, and so you get mg divided by m, and then magically the m on the top and the m in the bottom cancel, and so you get uh, g, which then turns out to be 9.8 meters per second squared. So there's a unit's equivalence between Newtons per kilogram and meters per second squared. So it's this amazing coincidence that the, uh, I guess, the amount of gravity force is proportional to how much mass there is in an object. That's one fact. And the other fact, totally unrelated, is that the amount that uh, an object accelerates with a certain force on it is inversely proportional to its mass. It's inertial mass. More mass, the less it accelerates. So you've got an M on the bottom, and you've got an M on the top, and they cancel. And that's why they accelerate with the same rate. It's an amazing coincidence. <laughs> At least that's what Isaac Newton believed. It was discovered in 1905 by Albert Einstein, or 1915, in uh, the idea of uh, general, general relativity, is that it's not an amazing coincidence. What's happening is that really what gravity is doing is bending space-time and causing this acceleration. And so it's, it's, a, it's what's called a pseudoforce. And so it's, it's not a coincidence that it's the same M on the top as it is on the bottom. But we're just doing Newton's laws, and so we're in the coincidence idea. Here's something from my age sheet, is that I just wrote down these, these really good equations. The equation of zero acceleration, and then these equations of constant acceleration times 20 minutes. 
Um, and then I, I guess another, I can just rearrange this. The way I usually remember this is that V is, is the distance divided by the time, right? So the displacement divided by the time. That's if there's no acceleration. If there is an acceleration and you know it's constant and non-zero, then these are the equations. There's four really useful ones that, that I, tend to, I tend to use based on the uh, quantity that I don't care about. If I don't care about an object's final position or how, what its displacement was, then I tend to use that, that top equation, 2.5, because it doesn't have an x in it. And if I don't care how fast an object's going at the, at the end, and that often happens like you drop the ball, and it's like, how long does it take to hit the ground? Well, the hidden thing there is that no one cares about the ball's velocity just before it hits the ground. And that's why everyone uses equation 2.6, because it doesn't contain that final velocity nobody really cares about. Uh, if, if there's no information about the, the time interval, you use that the v squared minus v initial squared. And if it doesn't contain the acceleration, but you can assume the acceleration is constant for some reason, then you can use this last one. Can we do an example? It's a bit of a longer example. Yeah, this is problem 16, which has been giving people problems or <laughs> issues in the office hours, so let's just try it. Um, some people in a hotel are dropping water balloons from their open window onto the ground below. Okay, so this is the trick. They're above you somewhere. They're somewhere in on some, it's a big hotel, and so you're on some floor, the fifth floor or something like that. They're at some distance above you and you don't know, but you wanna call management and complain. So what you do is you see that the balloon takes 0 0.15 seconds to pass by your 1.6 meter tall window. So where should security go and look for the guests that are presumably, your assumption is that they're gonna drop the water balloons from rest. If they're throwing it down, then you're not gonna be able to solve this. But let's just say they drop it from rest, then you can um, catch them. So this is the 1.6 meters, is the height of your window. And I think this is the trick, is that when the water balloon gets to your window, it's already moving at some speed v1, and then when it gets down here, it's moving even faster with some speed v2. Um, and I'll maybe say that this is like t1 is zero seconds or something, and down here, t2 is 0 0.15 seconds. So this, t2, is the time uh, to travel the height of your window. sense. Uh, and you need to do is uh, find um, how far above your window it was released from rest. Um, was, oops, sorry, was the balloon released from rest? So the simplifying diagram, I'm going to assume, again, it's good to state your assumptions, that the initial uh, drop was uh, from rest. Okay, and then I'm going to divide the motion into two segments. Before it hits the top of your window and then as it's passing your window. One, two, two segments. They're both the same acceleration, but it's sort of two different things going on. Segment one is before uh, the balloon gets uh, to the top of my window. Because that's important. So V0 is equal to zero is the initial. Also, it's like zero, it was dropped. Time one is when it hits the top of your window, and then time two, it hits the bottom of your window. Make sense? So V1 here is the final. 
for that segment. And what we need, actually this is what we're trying to find for the problem, is y1 is the distance traveled. I want to know how far are the raucous hotel guests uh, above the top of my window, right? And I don't care about um, something, about the time it took. So that's a hint that for that one. And then segment two is that V1 is now the initial velocity. So the final velocity of segment one becomes the initial velocity of segment two. Um, I guess this is whatever, final of seg one. And then uh, T2 is 0 0.15 seconds and Y2 is 1.6 meters. And what I don't care about here about um, V2 final speed. So that's a, that's a hint for what equation will work well for that one. So um, segment one again. So now we're in the represent mathematically stage. So I'm going to use, since I don't care about T1, I'll use equation 2.7. And I'll solve for V1, the thing I do care about. So 2A times y, Y1. minus y0 is equal to v1 squared minus v0 squared. So some of these things are zero. I think that this is zero. It's a really, well, it's the distance, I guess. And then uh, this is zero. Point being that v0 is equal to zero. Um, A is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared because it's in free fall. So you get 2g times y1 is equal to v1 squared. You get v1 is equal to the square root of 2 times g times y1. So that's segment one. Segment two is that you use, the thing I didn't care about is the v2 final speed, which comes up a lot. So I'm going to use um, equation 2.6 and solve for... Um, for V1, and then, then it should all work out. So Y2 is equal to V1 times T2, like the initial speed it was, just when it got to the top of your window, plus 1 half G times T2 squared. So V1, I think, equals Y2 minus a half GT squared divided by uh, T2. So now I've got these two things. Hold on a second here. I've got this equation, and I've got this equation. And what I can do is combine them and set V1 equals V1. Because I've got V1 from one equation and V1 from another equation. So I've got square root of 2 times G times Y1 equals y2 minus 1 half g t2 squared divided by t2. So just solve it out by uh, squaring both sides. You get all this stuff, y2 y minus um, 1 half g t squared, all squared over t2. Uh, it takes a little bit of math. To, to work this out, um, but basically y1 is equal to 1 over 2g um, times all this stuff squared. That's 1 half g t2 squared over t2 all squared. And then I guess the solve and evaluate step would be that y1 is equal to, we can just plug in all the numbers, 2 times 9.8 uh, times 1.6 meters minus the 1 half times 9.8 times uh, 0 0.15 was that initial time, uh, divided by 0 0.15, sorry, squared, 0 0.15, and then square the whole thing, and I get y1 is equal to 5.03 meters. So 
I guess basically security should look five meters above the top of your window. Above the top of your window. Window. Okay. How are we doing? <laughs> yes. Question. Mic. No, it's up. Um, so how come we care about segment two at all? Because isn't the question saying um, they drop it from initial um, distance zero and initial speed zero, and then it takes 0.15 seconds to get to your window, and you know the acceleration? So yeah. You can That's, just solve that. Yeah, I got that in, in the officer as well. The problem is that it's only, um, you're only given the, one point, the point 0.15 seconds while it's going past your window. You don't know at all how much time it took between when it was dropped and when it got to the top of your window. That's not given. All you see is that it hits the top of your window and 0.15 seconds later, it's moved past your window. But it was dropped some unknown amount of time before it hit the top of your window. Sound, sound good? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the trick of this one. Yep, question? Go ahead. Um, so since we're treating, uh, are we treating up or down in positive direction? Because if we're at 1.6 meters up, wouldn't the um, 9.8 be negative? Yeah, so I've, that's a good point. I've defined um, down to be positive in this problem, I think. So why is the 1.6 meters positive? Because moving down, so it moves down plus 1.6 meters, and gravity is oh, plus 9.8. Oh, so we're 1.6 meters from the top of the thing, not from the bottom? Oh, okay. It goes down, so the motion of the thing is positive, positive velocity, and it's accelerating. Um, I want to do a couple of, um, yeah, I probably should have put that. That's a really good point. <laughs> so I've somewhere I've defined um, plus y is down. That's probably something I probably sh should have put in my simplifying diagram step, but I was sloppy there. Excellent point. Okay. I want to do another top hat question right now. I'll post that. Here's a hockey puck shot into a goal. And um, what I show you is the velocity versus time graph. It's going with positive velocity, then it hits the net and stops, okay? So which of these four position versus time graphs makes the most sense? Which of the lettered position versus time graphs best matches the motion? I think four of them don't make a lot of sense, and one of them is, is, is okay. So I'm going to give you um, two minutes to think about that, discuss with your neighbor, and then click in. This is just sort of showing it's a little bit small there, unfortunately. There it is. There's three seconds.
Okay. Please click in. Okay. Once, going twice. Um, the way I see it, I see what people answered here. A lot of people are answering D, which I like. Um, okay. So what I think is happening is that this looks like to me that the, I guess the slope is zero. Uh, is zero, so that means it's stopped, so that can't be right. And um, then there's something here is like maybe not possible. Something can't just suddenly teleport from one place to another and change its position, I guess. Um, and same sort of thing, this is it's starting off stopped and then it changes, so, it, so this is the one I like. It starts off with some positive slope and then suddenly stops, but it doesn't teleport its position. Okay, so this is an interesting one. This is maybe the last one we'll do. A Toyota Camry can accelerate from 100 kilometers per hour, sorry, from rest to 100 kilometers per hour in 6.5 seconds. Kind of slow. <laughs> um, that's the kind of car I drive. Okay, a Porsche 918 Spider can accelerate from rest to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.6 seconds. So presumably this was tested on a track somewhere where someone put the pedal to the metal and, and uh, went as accelerated as fast as they could. So, we're not given acceleration here, but let's just assume constant acceleration. If you were to assume constant acceleration, which by the way is bad for cars, because they probably don't have constant acceleration. Um, during the test, which car would drive the longer distance? Maybe have a chat with your neighbor about that one. I'll tell you what I think. Yeah, sorry, it's kilometers per hour, not kilometers per second. <laughs> no Toyota can go at 100 kilometers per second. <laughs> sorry about that. Typo. Um, okay. All right, let me just show you what I was doing here. This is an uh, idea here. You're asked about the longer distance. Um, so, let's see what people said here. Most people are saying the Camry. Um, so what I was thinking is basically that, um, what are you trying to find? You're trying to find the distance. Let me see if I can go back and see the equation I wanted to use here. Um, you're given the times. So you know the time is known. Time is known. And also V final is known. V and V initial are known. And then you want um, uh, X. So what do you don't care about? Nobody really talks to you about the acceleration, but it's assumed to be constant. So I'm going to use this equation that X is equal to X0 plus V0 plus V divided by 2 times T. It's sort of a weird equation, but basically what you get is for um, X, I guess, uh, Toyota, it's going to be something like, um, whatever, it's an X initial. It's going to be 100 kilometers per hour plus zero divided by two times 
uh, 6.5 seconds, 6.5 seconds. And then, so that's like 50 kilometers per hour times 6.5 seconds. So you're gonna need some unit conversion, but that's what you're gonna times by. The X for the Porsche um, is gonna be same thing, 100, because it ends up with the same final speed, plus zero, divided by two, but times 2.6 seconds. So it's again, 50 kilometers per hour times 2.6. Since it's spending less time, they both have the same average speed, which is 50 kilometers per hour, because that's the test, but the Toyota is driving that average speed for a lot longer than the Porsche. So it doesn't, doesn't go as far. So I did like, uh, I liked A for that one. Okay. I have another question I'll do next time. <laughs>